he is the chair of that thing, so... Oh, no, whenever... whenever it's coming up. Thumbs up. Okay, I'm gonna... I'll be brief. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Danchev, who's going to give this special talk on Casimir forces. Um, like most of you have probably never seen me before. I was, for 10 years I was sequestered in Murphy Hall. <laughs> Uh, but I'm glad to be back. Uh, I'm uh, anyway. Daniel is he's a prof he's, he's a professor at Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, also head of the Department of Mathematical Modeling and Numerical Simulations in the Institute of Mechanics. Uh, he's an acknowledged expert in various fields in statistical mechanics, and more recently, he's he's been doing some very interesting and important work on the Casimir. Uh, phenomenon. He's actually also uh, no stranger to UCLA. He's been here every summer for the past 15 years. Oh. So yeah, so uh, and he's all, I guess he's a Bruin, right? Yeah. Bruin in exile. Um, so anyway, it's uh, I, he needs time, which I don't, so I'm going to yield the floor to him. Okay, thank you for the introduction. I have been asked to provide some general talks on Casimir effect, so as introductory as possible. Uh, every now and then, of course, uh, I'll have to run through and I will stress a few points which are sort of making easier to understand at, le at least the basis of what's going on there. But as you will see, it's a vast field, so there is no chance to cover everything. Definitely no chance to cover everything. So I'm going to speak about the Casimir effect, what it is and why it's interesting. So the story starts in May 29, uh, 48, when Casimir presented a talk at uh, uh, Holland, in Holland, on uh, Koninklijke Academy of Sciences. Koninklijke Academie der Wetenschappen. Okay, that's in Dutch. <laughs> and the talk was also in Dutch. <laughs> and uh, there he did study to perfect plates, which are in vacuum. Uh, they are perfect in the sense that they are perfect conductors, they are uncharged, and they are non-magnetic. And what he has found is, in his formulation, that uh, they impose some boundary conditions on the vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, and due to that, they attract each other with a force per unit area, which he calculated, and this is the answer. And that's a little bit striking answer, uh, in the sense that there is no non-universal parameter here. You have only the Planck's constant, the C, and uh, pi, L is the distance between the plates. So everything is perfectly universal. We will later speak a little bit about that again, but that was uh, uh, the first uh, uh, thing to be observed, and second, that it is attractive force. Of course, you can make some dimensional considerations, and uh, out of dimensional considerations you can conclude that it has to have the form HCOL to the fourth, but the prefactor you have to calculate, and I will tell you briefly how you do that. It's not a complicated calculation. The first article of Casimir is just three pages long. Introduction, some calculation, and conclusion. So, very brief article. Uh, and uh, here it is, uh, you can think, uh, depicting the situation. You have vacuum field around, and uh, there are these two perfectly conducting plates. They impose boundary conditions on the uh, vacuum fluctuations, which, okay, if, because they are perfect plates, you do know that the electric field shall have zero component of e, e, zero e component per, per parallel to the plates. Of course, that uh, condition uh, you can easily solve, and then you get some spectrum which is L dependent. From there, you can get L dependent force. I'll make that more precisely in a moment. One way of thinking about that, maybe the most intuitive way, is it, okay, you have uh, some virtual photons inside and outside, 
the amount of virtual photons inside is uh, limited with respect to that ones which are outside because of that the radiation pressure of the virtual photons inside is smaller than those outside and because of that you have force of attraction. It is sort of explanation, uh, a very natural one. Then, 30 years later, Fischer and Dejen studying uh, the behavior of uh, uh, fluids at, around a critical point, uh, they uh, realized that something very similar shall happen in such fluids because if you have plates there, they can be metal, they can be dielectric, they can be whatever, they impose boundary conditions on the fluctuations of what fluctuates there, namely the order parameter, like we normally describe the systems in statistical mechanics, which say it can be the density, the magnetization of its binary liquid mixture, the difference in the concentration of one component over the other component. And what they have calculated is that the force is of this form. You see, it is very much similar as that one for d equal 3. So, realizing that hc over one of these l's is some sort of, uh, c over this length is some sort of characteristic frequency. So, h then this characteristic frequency is some sort of energy. Here, kvtc is also some sort of energy, is energy which is related to uh, the temperature uh, and putting here d equal 3 half of expression very similar to that one How, uh, however you have here this delta which is called the Casimir amplitude and it depends on the boundary conditions and this delta turns out can be both positive and negative or almost zero so you can play with the boundary conditions and you can play with the liquid in between uh, to make the force whatever you'd like to be. And uh, one of uh, the possible practical applications we are going to speak about is using liquids in between in order to manipulate the Casimir force. Okay, you can, uh, here I speak about non-polar fluids, just because if I put here polar fluid, then the story will become even more complicated. It will be a double layer near the boundaries, then it will be uh, a spatial distribution of the charges in between the plates, so the story is getting more and more and more complicated. We don't need that at the <coughs> moment, just that there is a very good similarity between the two effects at least in the perfect case. Of course, you can think about any other interaction between whatever other material bodies in, immersed in a medium that is fluctuating. And both the medium and the material bodies are having constituents which are either at a finer temperature, so there should be some fluctuations, or they are quantum. And because of that, again, there shall be some fluctuations. So you cannot get rid of those fluctuations. They are unavoidably there. However, the interesting effect is when those fluctuations are mediated by massless excitations. So, say, photons, which are massless, then uh, Goldstone bosons in statistical physics, the critical fluctuations of the order parameter and similar and similar. So all what you need to have is uh, some um, interaction mediated by fluctuating quantities. And because of that, you see today the Casimir force is object of studies in all these fields. Quantum electrodynamics, chromodynamics, cosmology, condensed metaphysics, soft metaphysics, biology, nanotechnology. Let's mention, before I forget, that there is a prediction that uh, the, Casimir, the gravity shall get modified below a micrometer. And in order to check that experimentally, you have to subtract all other forces. And one of the forces which is making your life complicated is the Casimir force. So you have precisely to know the Casimir force between two bodies, to subtract that, and then to speak about the gravity force between objects below 
a micrometer. Uh, of course, I cannot cover anything like that for two hours. Because of that, I give you a list of reviews. There are around 40 reviews on the Casimir, but they are recording it so that you can go over that when you are on your own and check uh, different aspects of the Casimir effect. Uh, just uh, a day ago, a one, a one Russian review did appear, but it is more or less on applications in nanotechnology, so I didn't put it here. So the list is growing. Yeah? Let's see. Okay, I said that the story starts with uh, uh, Casimir, of course, because it's Casimir effect, but there are some people who are insisting that basically everything starts with Einstein. And if you insist on that, okay, you have one good example uh, about Einstein in 1907 studied the voltage fluctuations in a capacitor due to non-zero temperature. And uh, because of that, of course, there will be some fluctuating induced force between the plates of the capacitor. So Einstein in 1907 did study fluctuation induced forces and not exactly those which Casimir did study, but he did something about that. This article, unfortunately, is in German. Uh, OK, what out of all that one is good to keep in mind is that the Casimir force is negligible for distances above micrometer scale. But when you go below at micro and nano distances, it turns out to be the dominant force between neutral non-magnetic objects. And, uh, OK, what we are going to do, we are going to cover more or less the quantum mechanical Casimir effect. I'll speak about the static and uh, present uh, Casimir, and we'll present the, the basic theoretical facts, the basic experiments. Uh, we'll briefly discuss the possible applications, and briefly I'll speak about dynamical Casimir effect because it is sort of uh, importance for fundamental understanding of nature what is happening with uh, uh, nature when you have a mirror that moves very fast and uh, with acceleration which is not uh, zero and so on, you will see what is uh, supposed to happen. Then we are going to continue with the thermodynamic Casimir effect where I'll speak about the effect near the critical point. There are some substances which are having ghost on mode, so massless excitations, uh, also below their critical points. One of them is helium. Here, uh, Professor Williams did uh, some work on, uh, on helium. And uh, uh, we will go over the basic experimental facts and uh, theoretical facts, and we'll consider again some applications. And at a given point, I will speak a little bit also about quantum critical Casimir effect which happens when you have phase transition, so critical point, but it's of quantum nature, so governed by a quantum parameter, and it normally happens at very low temperature, so T equals zero normally. And then if you are very low, with a very low temperature there, you have a very nice uh, interplay between the uh, different effects. Uh, within the uh, Casimir effect, I will briefly also mention some Casimir-like uh, effects. So, Professor Brinsma did something like that uh, in uh, membranes. So, uh, you see uh, people are uh, in involved here. Uh, and uh, when I speak about the critical Casimir effect, I will mention, I don't know how many articles already we have with Professor Radnik, six or something like that, around six articles on uh, different aspects in different models. We basically studied basically all uh, important models in statistical mechanics in different uh, aspects, including also in connection with helium. OK. Ah, I forgot to mention something which is with some importance. Of course, the force is proportional to the driving force of the fluctuations. So if we speak about fl quantum fluctuations, the driving force shall be proportional to the Planck's constant. And if we speak about temperature fluctuations, they have to be proportional to the temperature. And see here, you can have, say, binary liquid mixtures with uh, 
critical temperature around room temperature. So, like what alluded in one of the uh, favorite uh, mixtures in which experiments have been done. And uh, this factor can be quite large. So, because of that, you can have Casimir force due to the fluctuations of the temperature fluctuations larger than that one. Daniel, yeah? in the previous equation you just showed, the capital delta cas is that like the concentration difference? No, 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 no. Uh, this is universal number that depends only on the universality class okay. and what the boundary conditions are. So, if I'm speaking, say, about uh, I, I'll show uh, specific examples with a lot, for a lot of models uh, on the second lecture, probably. But it is of the order of one, and it's universal number. Uh, it's just a number. Uh, OK. Now, uh, let us continue with the quantum Casimir effect. There, we do have even a poem. Uh, done by Scott Snyder. Casimir made a discovery profound with two parallel plates and nothing around. Vacuum, as it was known to be, is not nothing. Indeed, it's a seeding sea. That's one of the ideas what vacuum is. Two perfect conductors without any charge, smooth as can be, and extremely large. And strange when they are a tad apart. When placed parallel with no thermal motion, attract each other like two ships on an ocean. We will see about that in a moment, that that one with the ocean is, uh, you know, taken from somewhere. Uh, the basic expression for t equals zero, derived by Casimir, uh, was this one. And if you put here uh, L 10 nanometers, which is roughly 30, the, the size of 30 normal atoms, you will get that the Casimir pressure, that's the force per unit area, the Casimir pressure is about one atmosphere. So it's huge. And if you would like to have <coughs> nano devices, indeed nano devices, you unavoidably will have to take this force into account. People now are speaking about nanotechnology, but actually they still deal with devices at micrometer scale. When they go to nano, and sooner or later they will do that, <laughs> that problem will be, you know, one of the problems they will have to resolve. And uh, that actually represents, if you want, the fundamental problem for the nanotechnology. We are even not thinking about. If you have uh, an object, uh, the fundamental problem of nanotechnology is to take one object from somewhere and put it at another place, say point B. It's easy to take it from the point A, it's difficult to put it at the point B. And why it's difficult to put it at the point B? Because the gravity is so small uh, for this nano object that it sticks to whatever uh, you grabbed it with, say some gripper, which is made of some material. It sticks there and doesn't want to fall down. And if you want to put him down, you have to shake him or something like that, and it goes away from the field of view or something like that. So it's a very tough problem. And one of the ways to resolve it is to do that in a liquid. But we will speak about that. Engineers don't like that. Uh, OK. So here, perfect plates, uh, vacuum in between. And of course, one would like to know uh, zero temperature. What will happen if the temperature is not zero and if you have realistic bodies uh, and uh, 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 their characteristics. The first article in that respect is done by Lifshitz, 1955. And the expressions are in terms of dielectric function E at a given frequency omega of the corresponding bodies. Later, Jolushinsky and Pitaevsky joined him, and they. Uh, the first article is when the medium in between is vacuum, then they did put another dielectric in between. And so you have a sandwich structure of three materials characterized by three different uh, E sub omega permittivities. Can I write this here? Yes, also you have E1 of omega, that is one, then you 
have something which normally in my talk will be E naught, so some material in between, uh, in the simplest case vacuum, and here it is another plate E2 of omega. And E2, later you will see uh, that it is the what is important is the behavior of these quantities at imaginary frequencies. And uh, when we have something like that, so this sandwich structure is such that that condition is fulfilled, we will see that you can have repulsion between these two objects here, which are separated by another, say, fluid here. And, uh, say the experiment of Capasso, brombobenzene, gold, and silica. OK, in the poem, there was something about the sea. And indeed, uh, <laughs> uh, there is one article published in Nature that mentions an explanation given in uh, where, where it was American Journal of Physics about a phenomena observed in the French Marine. It was. 1836, so it's indeed between ships staying in harbor, and they are staying quietly there, and under given conditions, suddenly they start to attract each other, and with unfortunate outcomes, uh, so they break or something like that. And the explanation which uh, this gentleman, Boersma, suggested is basically the same explanation one has for the electrodynamic Casimir effect. The number of waves allowed in between the ships is different from that one uh, outside, so you have radiation pressure of the waves outside larger than that inside, so they get uh, together and they stick. Okay, the story back to Casimir, the article, the first one, is on the attraction between two perfectly conducting plates. And uh, here it is the beginning of the article. As I said, three pages. And here is the end of the article, the famous uh, expression for uh, the force. It starts with their calculation with uh, uh, Polder about the interaction between two atoms, which they did earlier and published in FISREF. Uh, and the result there is uh, proportional only to the static polarizabilities alpha 1 and alpha 2 of the two atoms. So it decays as R over 7, not the usual R over 6 as for the Van der Waals forces. And it's proportional to the polarizabilities, and there is no other non universal parameter appearing there. So that was sort of surprising for Casimir. If you go through the article, it's a very long, complicated article with a lot of calculations there. And uh, at the end, uh, the result is so surprising. Yeah. Daniel, um, for the Van der Waals London force, it makes a difference whether it includes retardation effects or not. So I had exactly. a question. Um, for the Casimir force, is there any discussion of retardation? Effect? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, one of the Okay, if you want the simplest way to think about the quantum Casimir forces is retarded uh, Van der Waals forces. Oh, okay. They are already, of course, they're, so it's, it's relativistic. Van der it's R to the 7. Okay. And this R to the 7 happens, okay, let, let's go a little bit in detail. So one of the ways to think about what's going on, uh, he mentioned the London forces, say you have one atom, the other atom, uh, the charges are fluctuating. So at a given moment, you have surplus here of plus charges. They induce surplus of negative charges in the other one, so they attract each other. And that normally goes as 1 over r to the 6. That's the usual Van der Waals force. However, there is some time when this surplus of plus charges appear here to pass the message to the other atom that I do have positive charges here. And that depends, on, of course, on the frequency and on the distance between the atoms. 
So some simple calculations will already tell you that if the distance is of a given uh, order, it has to decay faster. And that is r to the 7. So that is the retarded Van der Waals interaction. So the Casimir effect can be derived in a lot of different ways of thinking. So there is a derivation, which is, as I have shown you, the simplest one based on uh, zero point fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. But there are several derivations which do not use at all zero point fluctuations. And there are even people which are claiming, like Mr. Jaffe, that that thing with the zero point fluctuations, you better forget. Uh, all what is happening is material fluctuation of uh, charges and currents from one object to the other. And you know that with the zero point fluctuations of the electromagnetic field, there is another problem related to, okay, if they have energy, through Einstein relation, they have to relate it to mass, and that goes to, Hama, uh, to the uh, this Hubble constant, and you will get a value which has nothing to do with the experiment. So, but zero point fluctuations are in any book of uh, quantum mechanics. <laughs> so, I'm not one <laughs> to make big statement here, uh, but I'm just saying that there are people who can produce, and, uh, and it is produced by serious people, derivation of the Cassini effect in several different ways. And you get the very same result, if it's about the force, the very same result. Right. Uh, so, electromagnetic field between two perfectly conducting plays, just sketch how you do the calculation. You need to calculate the force. You prescribe for to any mode one half h omega k, so zero uh, point uh, energy, and uh, then uh, take into account that the spectrum is like that, and uh, making the calculation, which uh, you can say look in what Casimir did. It is a very straightforward one. You get that the force between the two plates is decaying exactly in the way the Casimir obtained. Much more complicated is the story with the Lipschitz theory. As I have told you, the, parallel, the force per unit area, so that is the pressure between two perfectly, uh, between two parallel plates, is expressed in terms of permittivities uh, and actually at imaginary frequencies. Okay, the people can measure these permittivities, of course, for real frequencies. And then when they do that, they uh, can obtain the two parts, the real and the imaginary part. And then using the Kramer -Kronig, Kramer's Kronig relation, they can determine what is the permittivity at the imaginary frequency. And it's a positive quantity. So everything here is defined. The frequencies here are the so-called Matsubara frequencies. And uh, out of these uh, uh, expressions, a lot of things are coming out. First, if you have vacuum in between, the force is attractive. Point. Second, if you have two objects here, uh, E1 and E2 to be the same, the force is attractive. And if you have it like that, then it's repulsive. And this has been well known, actually. Uh, it's not very rare for weighting phenomena when it is like that, because basically all complete weighting uh, pictures, this is fulfilled. So this is not a rare event. So measurements. We have the theory. People tried to measure the effect a uh, few years after the articles of uh, um, Lipschitz, but uh, the technique at that time was such that they got some quantitative, uh, qu uh, qualitative agreement. So it was in that direction. Yeah. And then the first who seems to, so it's recognized, they the first one who really <coughs> recognized of measuring the effect with uh, a reasonable precision is Mr. Lamoureux, and he measured 
uh, it between two closely spaced conductive surfaces. Uh, they are, one of them is, uh, so one of the surfaces is sphere, spherical lens, which was then uh, coated either by copper or gold, and the other uh, it was optical quartz, but uh, the plate, but it was also coated with gold or uh, copper. Why it has to be covered with metal, preferably gold, uh, most of the experiments are done like that, because the, there is a huge problem with the so-called electrostatic patches. So electrostatic charges coming from anywhere, and because of the interaction, which is decaying too slow, they damage everything. So you have to get rid of them somehow. Because of that, the easiest way, you cover it with some metal layer, and then you connect it to some uh, uh, device that gets all the charges out, and that's it. Uh, so, 5% here, ah, then the second problem, turns out it's very demanding experimentally to keep two plates parallel enough in order to uh, have the needed precision. The best experiment that keeps two plates parallel enough today, a modern type experiment, reports agreement with the uh, theory to 15%, and it's not because of something else, it's because of this difficulty in keeping uh, the things parallel, so unexpected uh, at all things. Then, uh, here's the normal technique how one does that, so you have a cantilever, here's the sphere, when it goes to uh, near the plate, the cantilever bends, you, how much it bends, you can trace by laser, here photodiodes, and so on and so forth. And that is a picture taken from the experiments of, of Mr. Muhirian, who is nearby here. And uh, here it is again a sphere, which is on this triangular uh, county lever. Okay, one of the uh, preferred geometries is sphere. This gentleman, Edert, at that time in uh, Sweden, made the experiment between two crossed cylinders, and he claimed that he was able to measure the agreement between uh, theoretical and experimental curves to with 1%. And here it is the expression how you modify uh, the story if it's like that. Uh, and uh, again, so when you bring one cylinder to the other, this piezoelectric device bends, uh, produces some uh, charge, and uh, proportional to it, you can uh, calculate the force. The experiment done by Mr. Mandy Capasso in Persigian uh, reported repulsive Casimir forces, and that's exactly when this condition, what I have told you, is fulfilled. The medium in between is brombobenzene, and uh, uh, so they measured both repulsive and attractive, and it depends uh, if you have vacuum in between or you don't. When you have vacuum, it's attraction, of course. When you have this brombobenzene, uh, you see that in a serious area of imaginary frequencies, uh, this brombobenzene curve is indeed between the curve of the gold and silica, so exactly that condition is fulfilled, and you have net repulsion force. Because of that, you can have, of course, levitation of a gold particle there, or you can have uh, some sort of device, if you want, with, with ultra-low static friction. And uh, one, of, one type of uh, MEMS uh, proposed by the group of Mr. Capasso is something like uh, switch, so you have this torsional rod, and when uh, that ball is uh, coming close to the plate, uh, the plate is attracted, and uh, this thing uh, rotates, and it is switching something. Yeah. Daniel, can you understand the repulsive force in the original Casimir picture by saying the dielectric constant is such that you're enhancing the fluctuations between the plates? In the original, he has vacuum in between, yes, so course. it's impossible. So, but if you put in a dielectric constant, you can get repulsion, as you yeah. discussed. Yeah. Can you interpret in the sense that by a proper choice of dielectrics, you can enhance the fluctuations in the plates? So you still can talk about zero point motion. 
back in the days. I, I I don't know. You, you when you go to you have okay very very low temperatures. Uh, and in the very low temperatures, I'll tell you what the other problem is, but we will come to that, because the Lipschitz picture required the knowledge of behavior of these quantities at a given frequency. Yeah. And then the question is, uh, okay, if you lower the frequency uh, below a given, say, 10 to 14 hertz, it's optical, what they do measure, optic, or, or, or elliptic, uh, optical ellipsometry, easily, but when it gets down, what you do? So, yeah, I, I actually you have experimental you, problems there. I just, suppose you have two metallic hemispheres. Me metallic yeah. environment suppresses fluctuations. Yeah. So you might imagine that if you have a dielectric in between, then you get a repulsion because the fluctuations will be enhanced in between the plates and suppressed in the metallic region because it's conducting. Or uh, conducting. When we come to, it's not that simple, it's a balance. When we come to, say, thermodynamic chasm, you'll see that you have vastly fluctuating medium in between, and basically nothing happening at the boundaries, and it depends on what the field is doing at the boundary. For the sign of the interaction. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it is not so obvious uh, to, 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 to say from the very beginning what will happen. I have to know what type of boundary conditions there will be, and uh, that I do know it, it is coming from uh, the accumulating knowledge. It is not some simple explanation that it is like that, the result is like that. Huh? Uh, okay, so um, experimental setup uh, for measuring this uh, uh, when Bambu Benzine is here, is basically what I have already described. So, here are the basic experiments on the QED Casimir. And uh, what is to be eventually kept in mind is that the best what the experimentalists are claiming is that experiment of Decker and co workers. And they claim that they have measured agreement with the Casimir force to 0.19%. And here we will see the problems are starting. Uh, because then precise uh, comparison between the theory and the experiment did show that there are problems. And the problems are of the order of 2%. And they are persisting already 10 years. So, there are at least two groups which are uh, in mutual disagreement about uh, uh, the agreement between the theory and the experiment. Uh, okay, here are some basic reviews on uh, QED Casimir effect uh, and the Casimir conundrum I just mentioned. So, measuring the Casimir force. Uh, and uh, the need to have these functions at imaginary frequencies. So, partially they are coming from experiment. Today, the state of the art is that when they do the experiment, they measure the corresponding ease for the specific material they are using, so not tabulated somewhere in a given source, because it can have small deviations from uh, what is tabulated there. And uh, the experiments are showing inconsistency with the Lipschitz theory in the sense that you do not have the needed agreement if you use the Drude model. And the Drude model is a model for metal and everyone in solid state physics uh, probably will tell you that this is the model uh, they use in metals and that's it because for finite frequency, it has a finite resistance. I'm sorry, finite resistance. The, so it is a, a well-known model. However, suddenly agreement with restored if the conductors are modeled by lossless plasmas, so like plasma model. 
And this is something people do not understand. So the group uh, which is claiming that the Dulli model is still the best is that one around Lamoro. And uh, the group that is claiming that uh, the agreement is not good with uh, the uh, Dulli model, you see Mr. Mohirian somewhere was, uh, Mr. Panenko, uh, Klimšinska is she's also a big name. Uh, ah, that case, Mr. Mohirian and so on. So there is this disagreement. And then the people tried to understand what's going on here by clarifying, okay, which of those models eventually does agree with principal theorems of uh, the statistical physics, like Nernst Heat theorem. And then it turns out that the uh, Drude model uh, leads to violation. So it provides, uh, I forgot for the metals, it was negative uh, uh, result for T equals zero and positive for dielectrics, but something like that. In any case, not zero. So the uh, Drude permittivity leads to violation of the Nernst theorem. And uh, it looks like that the plasma model shall win the game, despite it looks like unphysical. Uh, then you have Bohr van Leeuwen uh, theorem for classical physics, and uh, at large distances, the quantum Casimir effect behaves like classical. So at that time, you shall be able to check Bohr van Leeuwen theorem for very large distances. And then it turns out that the Drude model is consistent with this theorem, but the plasma model is not. So it's a puzzle. Then you have this free charge carriers problem. There are devices which, when you shine a light on them, or a light on them, you create free charge carriers like semiconductors there, and you can change the number of free carriers orders of magnitudes, four, five, six orders of magnitude. But in the Lipschitz theory, free charge carriers are not participating. So it, they, they, there is some extension needed. So young guys like you eventually can work on that and extend the Lipschitz theory and put there what it is going to be with free charge carriers. But it looks like it is, again, a puzzle when they have to be taken into account and when not. So one thing is clear that when you increase the number of uh, free charge uh, carriers by making some dopants to go there, depending on the material and the dopant, the doped semiconductor will undergo insulator metal transition, will become sort of a metal. That's Mott Anderson transition. And then there are predictions, again, contradicting what will happen if a given material goes through such a transition. Uh, will the Casimir force jump, so make some very serious change, or it will do nothing? Because these imaginary permittivities, they don't change. So what is in the Lipschitz theory doesn't change. and. Uh, Uh, that is still one of the problems that has to be resolved, and it is not resolved. Okay, uh, then uh, some other materials are in the game, the so-called phase change materials, which are giving also some possible applications of the Casimir effect. Uh, when you uh, shine light on them, so laser pulse, depending on the intensity and uh, the time, uh, they can change from amorphous to crystalline phase. So they go through a phase transition. And when they do that, the Casimir force changes about 20%. Uh, OK. And it is reversible phase, uh, phase transition, so you can use that for realization of uh, switches, Casimir-like forces, with Casimir-like forces. Uh, you can also make uh, change in the magnitude of the Casimir force by using semiconductors, uh, shining light on them and something like that. And I told you already about the problem 
how this theoretically to be incorporated, uh, but experimentally one observes change in the magnitude of the Casimir force. Possible applications already once was alluded when you bring that ball closer to the plate, it rotates and uh, switches something. Uh, the bad message is that uh, due to the Casimir force, which is of the order of atmosphere below 10 nanometers, there is a very large attractive force normally, and because of that there is tiction which is irreversible adhesion, so they, the surfaces stick together, don't want to move anymore. And reducing, removing the Casimir attraction is, of course, then of technological value. It represents, I have already explained that, a fundamental problem of nanotechnology. And even DARPA was interested on this issue, and there was a special program uh, about that, and I will tell you some of the results about that. But the messages of uh, more, so they were looking for materials eventually able to have repulsion in a vacuum, not possible if they are not magnets. You know, with magnets it is a different story. Uh, the short message it is, uh, if, if, it, if you are at equilibrium, if you are at non-equilibrium, I will show you some examples when you can do that, but at non-equilibrium. Uh, Possible applications of the Casimir effect, one more here. Uh, okay, the fluctuations, they do depend uh, not only of what bodies you do have, but their mutual orientation, mutual position. So you have here corrugated plate and corrugated uh, cylinder. And when you move that plate uh, in the horizontal direction, that uh, thing here, the pinion, will rotate and they are not in contact. So um, this is also one possible application of the Casimir effect. So can one get repulsion? I told you already that DLP theory, uh, uh, Jolshinsky, Lipschitz, Pitaevsky, tells you it's possible if this is fulfilled for the permittivities of the three materials. Then you have several theorems that are saying this is not possible, if. And there is one theorem by Kenneth and Klitsch, which is saying that uh, if they are related geometrically by reflection, the two bodies one is speaking about are connected by reflection to each other, the force of uh, between them shall be always attractive, so it cannot be repulsive. Then there is another theorem, uh, of, okay, it's not a theorem but quite a substantial study that demonstrated the Casimir force between arbitrary planar and nanostructured metal dielectric slabs is invariant attractive at distances few times larger than the characteristic period of structured slabs. So one still continues to publish articles about eventual repulsion in metamaterials if they contain anything else except magnets, this is actually not possible. And uh, Mr. Kada is saying, okay, I cannot do anything. We published the result, we said it's not possible, but people continue to publish these things. If you put ma magnetic magnets, it's of course a different story. Then there is a very old theorem, uh, you see, uh, middle of 19th century, that any collection of, uh, no, Urshaw theorem, Urshaw theorem, charged body cannot be held, uh, held at stable stationary equilibrium only by electrostatic forces from other charged bodies. So only electrostatic forces are not enough. Then uh, uh, Mr. Kada and uh, co authors extended that to collection of classical objects at finite temperature containing fixed and mobile charges. They have concluded that uh, every configuration is unstable to small perturbation. What happens there? I see something on the top which is not continuing there, but okay. So, uh, 
uh, how one can still do sort of repulsion, non-equilibrium. In non-equilibrium, say you have radiation pressure from uh, something that is hotter to uh, something that's colder. And in principle, it can counteract the Casimir attraction that has been shown by this gentleman. Uh, the uh, radiation pressure is proportional to T to the fourth. You see, it's exactly the same for here. So if you introduce dt like that for distances above dt, the radiation pressure in principle can counteract the Casimir force. However, if you put here uh, reasonable parameters like room temperature, then d is of order of se 7 micrometers, which is too far from practical applications. Then this interesting result uh, that uh, non-equilibrium uh, forces can uh, make uh, repulsion. You see this ball was falling down. It is hot ball, but then it goes down and uh, then finally it falls, of course. It is going 900 Kelvin and here 300. So it's repulsed here and then goes down. That is from, uh, again, group of Mr. Khan. So is that still radiation pressure? Yeah. yeah. Uh, role of geometry. Thing that has been controversial for many, many years. Initially, even uh, Casimir introduced a model of electron uh, with uh, supposedly attractive Casimir force to compensate for the repulsive column force, and then uh, equalizing them, he got even this expression here. But it turns out that the force is actually repulsive for such a shell of uh, uh, charges. And uh, yeah, that has been obtained by this uh, gentleman, uh, uh, Barian and Duplantier. OK. Uh, However, see once again, due to the theorem of these two gentlemen I just told you about, if you cut this in two pieces, you make two symmetric halves, and they will unavoidably attract each other. So when you <laughs> close them, some singularities shall develop there, which are canceling this attraction and making it repulsion. So it is a tricky thing. So the story with the geometry is tricky. Casimir repulsion has been no, of course, argued here, but it is unstable. So this thing, when it goes to infinity, the potential of interaction is zero. When it's just in the middle, it is zero. It shall be something in between. So you can argue easily that it shall be some repulsion over there. Few words about, because it's important for understanding of the real world, dynamical Casimir effect. What is the dynamical Casimir effect. So you have, again, two mirrors, but one of them is able to move and move uh, very fast and move with uh, no zero acceleration. And then the prediction is, it has been done long ago, 1970s, that if you do that, you can transfer the virtual photons of the vacuum into real photons. So you can produce light out of darkness, if you want. Hmm? And that's physics. So it's uh, okay, and uh, this uh, uh, predicted 1970 effect is claimed to be observed and uh, in superconducting circuit uh, where the mirror is actually moving front of the electromagnetic field. Uh, so you can transfer uh, virtual photons into real photons. Then examples. Casimir-like interactions on membranes. Here, Mr. Brinsma is, uh, of course, an expert in the field. Uh, and uh, he did uh, uh, one article on that, maybe even more. I don't know. I, I have this. <laughs> uh, so if you have objects here, uh, of course, they, of course, uh, impose some restrictions on, on the possible fluctuations. So be between them should be some I, I haven't, but it has become an extremely active field. 
called membrane mediated proteins oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, coagulate. There are tons and tons yeah. of papers on it. Even in the uh, last uh, uh, years, I think uh, 2012, there was one article uh, basically claiming that uh, the concentration of um, proteins in the cell, the living cell, is uh, critical and it is a two-dimensionalizing model. Uh, it is adjusted like so that there is attraction between them at large distances. So the nature is working in, in that way. It's pure L article, believe it or not, but that is the story. Huh? Okay, there is, you know, a suggestion that you shall have also Casimir-like effect in granular matter. Again, you have here, say, some liquid in between, some uh, granular substances here, and they impose uh, some uh, uh, limits on the possible fluctuations, and because of that there is some attraction and so on and so forth. Okay. I will just briefly mention what is the thermodynamic Casimir effect and we finish here and we will continue with that in the next lecture uh, because it's just natural that we have one and then we have the other one. So the, these are the two gentlemen, Michael Fisher and Pierre Dijen, and they published that article. It is in French. Only the abstract is in English. Eh? Uh, phenomena at the walls in a critical uh, binary mixture. So basically what they have found is uh, that the two walls will attract each other uh, uh, in the conditions they did consider. But what one normally has, one has some boundary here, one, and some boundary here, two, and one has, uh, say, a gas or binary liquid mixture. Binary liquid mixture, you can think that the blue circles are A and the empty circles are B. And then, of course, you can have that one of them is preferred by the surface A, the other one is uh, surface 1, the other one is preferred by the surface 2, or both uh, are equally preferred or something like that if the surfaces are the same. Uh, and then what else you can have? Uh, it, uh, uh, you can have uh, this uh, just a liquid vapor, then you can have this thing being uh, helium. If it's a helium, then at the surfaces uh, uh, you shall have Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. So you have the possibility to play a very rich game. Of course, you can have the temperature of this thing equal to uh, this one and uh, in between, but you can have also temperatures which are different. So you can have also some parameter here conserved, and then if you change something locally, it shall proliferate through the system because the total amount of this thing is conserved. You have a huge amount of possibilities to play here and uh, you can generate both repulsive and Casimir, and uh, attractive Casimir force or force between them. And on top of that, there are substances, as I have told you, which are having uh, um, massless excitations, not only near TC, but also below TC, like helium. So you have also possibility to go in a very large temperature region and to uh, study this effect too. And uh, the Casimir force is normally defined in this way, so it is the derivative of the excess free energy uh, with respect to the distance between. And then and the excess free energy is the total energy of the system minus the bulk one. So that is what the excess free energy is. The excess is in the sense that you have something between these two things. And if you, of course, try to increase, say, L, you will feel some force, and this is the force we're going to study on Tuesday. You come there. Hello. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Then no, we go have lunch. Yes.
congratulations. Your artwork made the whole thing. What? Yeah, it's not the result of modern art. You're now, you now, and they say in part right. that you have the exhibit. Yes. Uh, who is going to collect these things? I'll take care of it. Maybe we can get a large, uh, you know, for this front page, we can get a magnifier we can put up in our room. But the other thing is, basically, I have a report. Absolutely, yeah, we need to do that. And it's, it's really not sensible that we don't have the eyes of group. I'm just.